Hello and welcome to another podcast by Midori Cast, where we aim to share positive stories, initiatives and ideas about the transitions that are happening as a result of the environmental issues we are facing. This is a program sponsored by the Podcast Factory Org and Transformer Brussels, a co-working space and innovation centre. Hello and welcome to Midori Cast. Today I'm with Alice Berlin from Seas at Risk. Hi Alice. Hi. Can you tell me about what Seas at Risk is all about and what role do you play within it? Sure. Um, so Seas at Risk is an umbrella organization which um, promotes ambitious European policies and legislation to protect the marine environment. So we are a member-based organization. Um, we have 33 members in 16 countries. Uh, our members are national or local or sometimes international NGOs who also work on the marine environment, protect the marine environment. And uh, we basically um, help them do advocacy at European level. So uh, push for better legislation, and we also help them with navigating how the EU works and um, yeah, and and how uh, they can play a role in that. Okay, and you're a yeah. po policy advisor, a policy officer. Yeah, um, yeah, senior marine policy officer, which is a long title. Okay. Um, uh, I work uh, mainly on two areas, um, which is well, I work basically on the protection and restoration of marine biodiversity, uh, focusing on marine protected areas and um, all the different legislation that regulates human activities at sea. I'm aware that you've launched the Blue Lung campaign, our Blue Lung campaign. Yeah. Can you tell me what, what that's all about? Where, where did it get its name? Yeah, starters? sure. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting name. Um, well, basically it comes from this very simple fact that a lot of people are not aware of, um, that our ocean produces more than half of the oxygen that we breathe. Um, so there's this common saying, every second breath we take comes from the ocean, for instance. Wow. Um, and we often talk about um, the, um, the rainforest as uh, the planet's green lung. And we thought that it would be a nice analogy to talk about the ocean as our blue lung. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the other half that we need uh, to, to exist, to be there. Um, and so starting from that uh, simple fact, and also the other fact that um, the ocean plays a very important role in um, helping to mitigate uh, the climate crisis. Um, the ocean is and, and the ocean seafloor and, and all of the plants in the ocean, they absorb a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. They're a, a really big carbon sink. So we wanted to raise awareness about the ocean's role in all of these um, you know, processes and, and how important mm. it is to keep it healthy and to keep it clean. Uh, to make sure that it can keep playing this very important role for all of us. Mm. So, yeah. Speaking of keeping it clean, <laughs> uh, the website Our Blue Lung actually brought me to the shocking fact that in the EU alone, the equivalent of four garbage trucks of plastic is poured into the sea every hour. Yeah. What are the ecological impacts of that? And yeah. is, it, is it possible to, to eventually put an end to this? To that yeah. massive amount. Yeah, we, we hope. Um, well, first on the impacts. Um, first of all, we we should say that we still have a you know very little understanding of how um, this amount of plastic and of waste entering the ocean how it's going to impact marine wildlife. What we have are. Um, you know, testimonies and, and video testimonies, for instance, seeing, you know, turtles with uh, plastic uh, beer um, mm. holders yeah. around their necks. Um, we have now a lot of examples of whales and, and, and dolphins and big animals washing ashore with their stomachs full of plastic. Um, loads of videos of birds um, uh, regurgitating plastic as mm. well that they ingested. Um, what we know is that the big, um, you know, plastic objects that go into the sea from from the land, 
eventually it breaks down into microplastics. Um, and that's really the main problem here because microplastics then just falls on the seafloor or just stays um, in, in the, the water column and it's ingested then by uh, birds, by uh, big animals, but also by fish. And even now we're seeing it being ingested by plankton, which is the tiniest the organism. Plankton, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tiniest organism in the sea, the, the famous plankton that actually helps us um, breathe, mm. that, that um, uh, creates oxygen for us, is now being impacted by micro nanoplastic particles. Um, so ultimately, you could also say that it will, you know, it, it comes back to us, especially because it's ingested by fish, and then in turn we uh, eat fish. Um, but all of this, for the moment, we're still at the very early stages of our, you know, scientific understanding of the impact that it it will have. Um, it's very clear that our generations, our society will be known as the plastic, mm. um, you know, era. We'll have a geolo geological uh, um, layer yeah, of yeah, plastic yeah. In, in, in the sediments, for sure. And that brings me to my second point, which is all of the plastic that's in the sea now, it's very unlikely that we're going to clean it up. That probably is there to stay until it goes down to the seafloor. Oh, okay. for, for, for thousands of years, okay. for... Yeah, I mean, it might degrade at some point, but we really don't know mm. when or how. It might just break down into smaller and smaller particles, but it's unlikely to disappear completely. Um, it might have less impact as, as it degrades, but we also don't know that. Um, so what we advocate for at Seas at Risk and through the Our Blue Lung campaign, for instance, is not just the cleaning up, I mean, doing beach cleanup is nice. It's a nice way of raising awareness. But we really advocate to stop um, the, the, the plastic flow at the source. So that means really think about our um, production and consumption patterns. Um, do we really need to have that much plastic around us, which eventually ends up in the ocean? And we're not talking only about recycling here. Recycling is also uh, one possibility to deal with the plastic that we already have, uh, but it will not um, stem, it will not stop, you know, the flow of plastic mm. into the ocean completely mm. um, for various reasons. So it's really about reducing the production of plastic at source, production and consumption of plastic. So for things like single-use plastic straws and, yeah. and stuff. Is there is there a, uh, a European ban now on, on straws? Yes, yes. It it just happened like a week ago. Uh, I mean, it's been in the in the in the books for a while, but last week it was finally adopted by the European Council, the European Environment Council. Um, there's this new legislation at at EU level which bans a number of items. Um, such as straws and, and, and cutlery, like plastic cutlery and um, balloon sticks and, and mm. things like that. Um, but it also introduces a number of other um, requirements that are very interesting. One of them is extended producer responsibility. So it now um, producers who use plastic or even produce plastic, but also the ones who just use plastic for their products, are going to be responsible for the disposal of this uh, plastic at the end of its life cycle so that it doesn't end up in the ocean. And that's really rev revolutionary mm. um, because there were um, such schemes existed already, but they were only voluntary and there was not a big you know, EU legislation that put it in place. This is something that at Seas at Risk, we're very proud of because um, we've been working on the topic of marine litter and, and plastic for more than a decade when it wasn't very trendy at the time. Um, and we actually produced a report two years ago on single-use plastics advocating for the ban of these plastics that composed 70% of what we find on the beach. Um, and this report um, was instrumental in adopting this legislation, so it's um, one of our achievement, we're very yeah, happy yeah, about it. <laughs> but now obviously comes the um, moment where it has to come into force and where member states, countries have to really put it in place and it has to work. So the work is just starting, it's not done.
one of the sort of most obvious things when we think of our seas being at risk is the risk of overfishing. I'm aware that the Fisheries Council of Ministers have not delivered on on recent policies, particularly surrounding deep sea species. Can you tell me more about that? Sure, um, of course. Yeah, overfishing is probably still the biggest threat to the oceans today. Even, you know, with the plastics, um, a problem being very prominent in the news, um, overfishing is still the, the biggest threat because um, for, for several reasons. The first reason is that um, when we overfish, we take a massive amount of fish biomass, of, of, of fish out of the ocean. And fish, you know, they don't exist only uh, to be fished by humans. They have a role in, in marine ecosystems. They have a key role. They are eaten by bigger animals and they eat smaller animals. And when you take a lot of them out of an ecosystem, then the whole ecosystem is, uh, is unbalanced and the whole uh, ocean, let's say, doesn't work as well as it should. Um, the other reason why overfishing is a big problem is because today the um, certain industrial fishing techniques are very damaging to the marine environment. So you have these big boats that drag nets on the floor, for instance, and that destroys all of the habitats, the plants and, and the reefs and whatever that's, that, that are on the floor. And that also has a, a big impact. So um, again, in the, in the European Union, we have this uh, great legislation, which is called the Common Fisheries Policy, which was reformed in 2013. And during the reform, one of the key objective was to make fishing more sustainable, to make sure that we could keep fishing, but within natural boundaries, that we would respect marine ecosystems while fishing. And one of the key objective of that was to um, stop overfishing, which means to fish at um, a lower rate, let's say, to fish less um, for all of the different stocks that, that, that swim in, in our seas. Uh, by 2015 and at the latest 2020. So, so that hasn't happened and we're still fishing over the limits uh, for um, a majority of, of stocks, especially in the Mediterranean, for instance. 87% of the fish stocks are still overfished. It's supposed to be over in this December and we're still at 87%, so it's not going to happen. And in the deep sea, you mentioned the deep sea. Um, basically, the limits are set by the um, uh, fisheries ministers every year. Uh, in December, um, and for the deep sea, it happens twi every two years. And the last chance that they had to bring this in line before 2020 was last year in um, November 2018. And it didn't happen. We still have a number of deep sea stocks that, for which the, the limits are set too high and which are going to be overfished in the, in the coming two years. So we are um, you know, we're telling ministers and we're telling people that that they have failed their commitment under the Common Fisheries mm -hmm. Policy for deep sea uh, stocks. For all the other stocks, they have one last chance, which is this December. Um, they are going to have to make a major effort if they want to actually achieve this goal. It's we it's likely that they won't, um, and and so overfishing will continue in in, in yeah. waters. And when, we, when we're talking about the deep sea, uh, I'm aware that there's sharks that can yeah. live up to 400 years yeah, at, at that level. So, mm. so uh, That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, under and a massive threat if, if, yeah. if, what, if their food supply is dramatically Exactly. Shortened. So that, that's what it is about. I mean, some of these deep sea uh, species, they're really vulnerable and they're really in danger of, of well, maybe not becoming extinct, but at least becoming rarer and rarer. Mm -hmm. and, and as I said before, they form part of a food chain and they are uh, necessary for other uh, big animals like this amazing shark, uh, for instance. Uh, yeah. When we think of the natural soundscapes of our oceans, we think of sort of the rumbling of the water, the moaning and clicks of dolphins and whales. But uh, today we're experiencing some quite unnatural sounds, some underwater noise. Can yeah. you tell me more about what, what that is? Sure. Um, it, actually, the ocean is not at all quiet. It's naturally already, it's not very quiet because there are a lot of animals who use um, 
what we call echolocation. So they make these noises like the dolphins to locate their food source, to locate their partners, uh, places where they reproduce. So um, noise is a very important uh, part of marine wildlife. Uh, for a lot of animals, it's, it's a really key um, sense that they use to um, locate themselves and, and to live. Um, but today, especially in European seas, but also elsewhere, our seas are extremely noisy because of human activities. What's interesting to know as well is that noise travels further and faster underwater than um, wow. on land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a single um, episode of noise can travel thousands of kilometers, uh, mm -hmm. also because it doesn't have necessarily... Uh, natural barriers like we might have with mountains and, and buildings and things like that um, here on land. There is less of that in the ocean, so noise can travel really, really far. Um, which means that it's not just surrounding the activity that is a problem. It can um, The impact of noise can go really um, much further than that. There have been countless examples now of, uh, again, big uh, mammals like whales and, and dolphins um, stranding on the beach with very clear signs of having uh, been impacted, uh, been harmed by noise. They have the they have blood in their ears, for blood instance. In yeah, ears. Um, they have brain damage, basically. Because you have to imagine that if you were to stand next to a plane taking off like really next to it, you would probably also have brain damage or you would have very severe ear damage, first of all, and you could even have, I mean, noise can be very harmful. Well, it's the same for marine animals. And what they're um, up against is first uh, shipping. So shipping is uh, one of the main source of noise in the ocean. It's, it, it's continuous noise. So from the moment the ship leaves the harbor to the moment it arrives at another harbor, it just it produces noise all along its, its course, basically. Um, and so it, that disturbs if it if it crosses the path of a you know a group of dolphins or a group of whales that disturbs them a lot drastically. Uh, another source of noise is what we call seismic air guns. So these are um, what is used to find uh, uh, oil under the seabed. So um, to extract oil from, from the seabed before we can extract it, we have to find it. And in order to find it, we use these uh, air guns that send um, very loud noises uh, repetitively for, I don't have the figures in mind anymore, but I think it's every um, minute or something like that for 24 hours, it, sound, it sends very strong um, noises uh, towards the seabed to mm. locate the the oil the the patch of oil underneath to be able to extract it um, and these noises are extremely loud they're louder than anything we have on land um, and again that's extremely disturbing yeah, yeah. for animals and as I said because it travel because noise travels really far even if um, it doesn't happen just next to um, where you know cetaceans might be they might still be impacted by it even if they are hundreds of kilometers yeah. away from it so um, and there and in European seas there are many more human activities that create noise that disturb yeah. animals we are even um, hearing today um, from scientists that noise might impact um, krill which is the little um, shrimps that mm. we find in Antarctica that they might also be impacted by underwater noise by these explosive sounds yeah, yeah exactly and and the continuous noise of shipping and um, so it's also a field where a lot more research is needed but what we say is that research is very good we're always in favor of more scientific data but um, we already know some things that we should be doing immediately that would help reduce the noise drastically, and we, we know that it would help uh, immensely. One of those measures is reducing the speed of ships, for instance. Today, ships go really fast mm -hmm. because they're under a lot of constraints, commercial constraints, to deliver goods very quickly. 
and they want to deliver as much as possible, so they go really fast. And it's like with a car. The fastest a car goes, the more noise it makes. It's the same with a ship. But we know that if we reduce the speed of ship by even just 10% or something like that, it would reduce the noise level by 50%. Or yeah. So this is a really an easy, mm. let's say, measure to put in place. Mm. Slow things down a bit. Slow things need down. To get that. Exactly. You don't need to get you need your TV so soon. Exactly. <laughs> Anything you order from Amazon? Yeah, yeah. It can wait a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what has industrial farming got to do with our oceans? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, what what we try to do with our blue lung campaign is really to show that a lot of what we do on land and what we do every day impacts the ocean and one of the big thing that we do every day is eat obviously um, and today the way our food is produced is often through intensive farming uh, industrial uh, agriculture um, and industrial agriculture has two impacts on, on the ocean the first comes from the use of pesticides which are chemicals which seep into groundwater and it, it basically flows into rivers and lakes and ultimately all rivers and lakes end up in the ocean. So that brings chemicals um, through you know, rivers and lakes into the ocean. That's one impact. And the second is the use of fertilizers. Um, so um, nutrients and, and phosphorus, which uh, farmers use to make plants grow faster. And what, what happens when there's too much nutrients in the ocean? Um, is this phenomena called eutrophication, where basically all the oxygen in an area is uh, absorbed by the, um, by the excess nutrients, so there's no more oxygen, so uh, basically um, the, the animals can't stay in this area. Mm. It becomes a dead zone, what mm. we call a dead zone. So there's a lot of algae on the top of it, and that blocks also the, the, the rays of the sun. So they become yeah, as I said, dead zones. And the Baltic, for instance, the Baltic Sea is very affected by this in Europe because it's surrounded, because it's a closed sea. Mm. Um, and it's surrounded by um, very industrious countries, uh, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Poland, mm. Germany, which are very big, you know, farm production countries. Mm. Um, and we say that in the Baltic Sea, there is a dead zone as big as Ireland today. Wow. The country of Ireland, so yeah, just absolutely no life. <laughs> where except where that life, algae uh, except from from for algae, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. it what you eat on land has an impact yeah. on the ocean okay. through that yeah. process, yeah, very much. Okay, uh, just a last question: What can people listening do to <laughs> to stop some of the, these horrible things happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that they can do two things. Um, first they can take a, a look at um, the way that they live, at their um, consumption habits, and think, okay, um, is this really necessary? What could I change um, to, you know, to, make, to make things better? So obviously, with the plastics issue, it's very easy to understand. So we're advocating for people to think about their uh, plastic consumption. Do you really need to buy that small bottle of plas like plastic bottle water um, right now, or can you wait in, uh, until you're at a place where you can just refill your own bottle? Um, do you really need that takeaway coffee, or can you wait until you're at the office and have your coffee there? Um, these little steps um, to just reflect a little bit on how you consume. Same with with the food um, with with the food that you that you consume. Um, you know, maybe eating more. Organic food um, could uh, can help because there's less pesticides used or more local food or less intensive. Obviously, with fisheries, it's about uh, trying to eat sustainable uh, fish. Mm -hmm. So uh, fish that are labeled um, and that come from sustainable sources. That's, that's one thing. That's really taking a look at how, you know, your everyday habits uh, might impact mm. um, our ocean. And, you know, our Blue Lung campaign website shows um, the, the, these different links. The second thing is actually that people should, should really tell their governments to do something. Because mm. 
individual action is important, but ultimately they also need to be supported by big, large actions taken at national level. That's also what makes a difference. And we don't want to put all the responsibility on the individual. We also think that governments have a big responsibility. It, actually, in Europe, there's this law. The, it's the, the European Marine Law. And it says that um, we should have clean and healthy seas by 2020. 2020, it's tomorrow, basically. Mm. And what people can do is tell their governments that they have to respect this law. They have to take action to respect this law because they committed to it. They committed to have clean and healthy seas and we're still very far from it. And governments have to stop the production of plastic. They have to help farmers transition towards sustainable agriculture, help fishermen transition towards sustainable fisheries, um, reduce the speed of ships, um, reduce chemical pollution or the use of chemicals in, produ in production. Um, and, you know, individual action matters, but it's also up to our governments to do something to stop all of these things from happening. So mm. people should tell their governments to step up and take action. Cool. Thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you for Thanks. interviewing me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>